So in this next series of lectures, we're going to cover both the general and the special senses, which are specifically smell, taste, sight, hearing, and equilibrium. We label those as special senses because of the specialized receptors that provide those sensations, um, and that they're often located on, in uh, complex sense organs as well. Uh, and these topics are going to be split across several videos, with this first one focusing on the general senses, um, including introduction to receptors in general, and then focusing specifically on tactile receptors. So our bodies are constantly being exposed to sensory information resulting from changes in both our external and our internal environments, and we refer to these changes as stimuli. Sensory information arriving at the CNS is called sensation, and if we are consciously aware of this sensation, we refer to that as perception. Now perception is only going to occur if the information reaches the cerebral cortex. Keep in mind that not all sensory stimuli actually reach the cerebral cortex. For example, if you're in a noisy, crowded room, there are likely many things going on that you are hearing, but not actually perceiving or paying attention to because they're being filtered out by structures such as your thalamus. Now, stimuli are detected by receptors in our body, which are specialized cells that monitor changes in either the external or the internal environment. Receptors can be structurally complex, such as the eye or other sense organs, or they can be very simple, just the dendritic endings in the nose for olfaction or the dendritic endings that are found in nerves in the skin. There are three criteria that we typically use to describe receptors. Uh, the receptor's distribution, the stimulus of origin, and the modality of the stimulus. And each one of these addresses essentially a different question. So with uh, receptor distribution, we're asking where are the receptors actually found? Stimulus of origin is considering where is the receptor stimulus coming from? And then we can also ask, well, what type of stimulus is the receptor actually meant to detect? And we're going to consider these three different criteria and see how we can group receptors into different categories based on these criteria. So let's start with distribution. Uh, the most basic and broad uh, distribution that we, uh, or distinction that we can make is between general sense receptors and special sense receptors. So general sense receptors are going to be found throughout the body and are overall structurally pretty simple, while special sense receptors are going to be located only in the head. Um, general sense receptors can also be divided, or subdivided rather, into somatic receptors and visceral receptors. Somatic receptors are going to be found within the body wall um, um, and distributed throughout the skin, and while visceral receptors are going to be in the walls of the viscera, in the walls of the internal organs, and in um, the walls of the blood vessels as well. Uh, those receptors are going to be primarily responsible for detecting things such as uh, the presence of different chemicals, changes in temperature, pain, touch, pressure, and so forth. Uh, the special sense receptors, though, as I mentioned, are only going to be located in the head, and these are the ones that are responsible for gustation or taste, olfaction, sense of smell, vision, sight, equilibrium, and hearing as well. Um, and all of those receptors are housed in complex organs that are going to be found in the head. So stimulus origin is another uh, criteria we can consider. Where is the receptor stimulus coming from? Um, Exteroreceptors, interoreceptors, and proprioceptors. Extero, think about external. Um, those are receptors that are detecting stimuli that are found in the external environment. You're going to find those in the skin or mucous membranes, such as uh, in the nasal cavity and the oral cavities. Interoreceptors, intero, internal, those are going to be detecting stimuli that are inside the body itself. So that's those are the kind that we're going to find in the walls of the viscera. Uh, those are the types of sensors that will detect things such as blood vessels stretching or um, the amount of oxygen or carbon dioxide that is dissolved in the blood, what an internal temperature is, and so forth. Um, and then proprioceptors. Uh, proprio actually, um, proprioceptors come, um, is based on the Latin proprius, which is Latin for one's own. You've probably actually heard this root before. If you think about something uh, such as property or something as proprietary, those all come from that same Latin root. These are receptors that are telling you something about your own body, um, and specifically your own body's movement and orientation. So these are the receptors that you're going to find in muscles and tendons and joints that are going to be able to detect body and limb movement. And then what I think of is kind of the fun one here, uh, the modality of the stimulus. What type of stimulus is the receptor actually meant to detect? Uh, and several different classifications here. Um, so let's just kind of walk through these and give a couple examples. 
chemoreceptors are designed to detect molecules that are dissolved in fluid, specific um, ones. So probably the most obvious um, example you might think about it are the receptors on your tongue that are responsible for giving you your sense of taste. Um, when you think about it, um, when we're talking about um, dissolved molecules, we can think about molecules that are also dissolved in small water droplets in the air. So um, your sense of smell is associated with chemoreceptors as well. But chemoreceptors are even, as I mentioned on the previous slide, associated with things such as your blood vessels. Your blood vessels have chemoreceptors that are able to detect the chemical content of your body fluids and then provide that feedback to your nervous system. Thermoreceptors are able to detect changes in temperature uh, in the skin and also on the walls of the internal organs. And so you have receptors that are designed to trigger and create a, an action potential based on hot temperatures and on cold temperatures, and receptors have their kind of own specific ranges. Thermoreceptors are examples of what we call free nerve endings. So these are nerves that don't have any kind of special structure at the tips of the dendrites. The, um, usually instead, at the, in the walls of those neurons, there will be proteins that are um, specifically involved with detecting a, a certain temperature range. And if that protein is triggered, then it is going to trigger the action potential in that entire, um, in the entire nerve, um, entire neuron, excuse me. Uh, photoreceptors are obviously there to detect changes in light, and we're going to find uh, two different types of photoreceptors in the eye that we'll discuss later, rods and cones. Uh, mechanoreceptors are detecting physical distortion in their cell membranes, and this can be caused by things such as touch, pressure, vibration, stretch, uh, cutaneous receptors of the skin, uh, and, and also even receptors uh, in your hear that are responsible for equilibrium and the detection of sound, because those are ultimately uh, being triggered by movement in the air or movement in fluids. Barrel receptors detect pressure changes in body structures. Think about um, barometers. Uh, an example of that would be receptors that are found in the connective tissue that it's in the walls of the bladder. When the pressure gets high enough in the bladder, that starts to trigger your, um, your nervous system to say that you need to um, expel that waste. And then nociceptors, these are kind of the interesting ones in, um, in my personal opinion, because these are the ones that are actually detecting tissue damage and pain. Uh, a lot of times we tend to think about pain as being something negative, but you know, pain is there for a reason. It's meant to tell us and give us some signal that we are coming into contact with something that is noxious, that is toxic, that is damaging in some way. Somatic nociceptors, uh, these are designed to detect chemical, heat, or mechanical damage to external body structures. Um, or muscles. So for example, if you were to burn yourself and uh, there are uh, nociceptors that, will able, that are able to send a signal in, um, giving your body information that there's been tissue damage there. If you sprain your ankle, there are nociceptors in the tendons that are able to detect that tissue damage. And then there are visceral nociceptors um, that are associated with the internal organs as well that can um, detect things such as um, smooth muscle that's been stretched too far, oxygen deprivation in the case of a heart attack, um, or chem um, damage from chemicals that are potentially re um, released due to internal trauma and are damaging tissue from that um, perspective. Now, sometimes our receptors can get confused or our brain can get confused on how it is interpreting information that is being sent from these receptors. So I kind of like to offer a couple little fun examples on this one. Um, Thermos receptors, which are again designed to detect changes in temperatures, can also sometimes respond to different chemicals. So for example, um, menthol can actually activate cold thermoreceptors and that explains this chilling sensation that you might feel after, for example, using mouthwash, brushing your teeth, or using something like an icy hot type of cream um, and that gives you that cool feeling afterwards. Um, another well-known nociceptor protein that responds to high thermal heat is also triggered by the chemical capsaicin, capsaicin which you may have heard before. Uh, that heard of before. That's the chemical that is found in spicy foods and chili peppers that gives them that quote hot sensation. Um, so that's why you feel this burn if you eat a chili pepper. Um, so next time you eat something spicy, consciously ask yourself if you're actually feeling heat 
or just the pain associated with heat because those are actually two different signals that are being sent to your body. And I think you'll probably agree, you're not feeling a temperature heat, you're feeling the pain associated with heat. Uh, interestingly, th this is one of the best, uh, a very well studied uh, receptor protein, especially because of um, research that's being done to help relieve pain. It's also triggered by spider venom. And that's why if you ever have been bit by a spider, it has that burning sensation. And that's why. Um, so if you've ever eaten a really hot chili pepper, you probably know about what it feels like to be bitten by a spider <laughs> as well. Um, interestingly, this chemical has also been added to some over-the-counter medications uh, in order to help produce that kind of warming sensation. So this is an example of an arthritis arthritis pain relief uh, cream that can be used and it has a small amount of capsaicin in it and that's why it provides that warming sensation. It's essentially a chemical that is tricking the thermoreceptors um, or the pain receptors, the nociceptors that are typically associated with temperature. Um, and then another interesting, uh, probably well-known example, how many of you guys have ever touched very hot water and noticed that before you feel it is hot, it actually feels ice cold initially. Uh, this is a a, a scenario that's referred to as paradoxical cold. And the, there are a couple different theories to explain it, but probably the most common one is that the nociceptors that are responsible for responding to potentially harmful heat can actually coexist on the same neurons as cold thermoreceptors. So when the nerve fiber sends the signal to the brain on, um, this, to say this is a painful heat stimulus, it can sometimes be misinterpreted by the brain as a sensation of extreme cold because the same neuron is responsible for sending both signals. Another way in which our brain can become confused is the process of phantom pain, which you've probably heard of before as well. Uh, phantom, phantom pain is a sensation that is associated with a body part that's been removed, usually an amputated limb. And so the question becomes, well, how can an individual feel pain when there aren't nerve endings there? If somebody has had their arm amputated from the elbow down below, how can they feel pain or interpret what they feel as pain in a finger when there's no finger there? There's obviously no nerve ending in that finger because the finger is gone. Well, something to keep in mind, you know, think back to what you know about the structure of neurons. If you have a sensory neuron that has its nerve ending in your index finger, Where's the rest of that cell located? Remember that that cell is going to, or that neuron, that cell is going to travel all the way up your arm. That axon's going to be going all the way up your arm to the appropriate spinal nerve. And the cell body even of that neuron is not there in the part of the arm that got amputated. It's there in that posterior root ganglion. So there's a lot of that cell that is still there. Now, sometimes after the amputation, those cells will die, but not always. Sometimes those uh, the axon and the cell bodies remain alive in the remaining part of that nerve. And so those will continue to provide sensation to the central nervous system anytime an action potential is generated in there. So for example, let's consider these two neurons that you see depicted in this individual who has had their arm removed and think about where the brain will interpret signals from those neurons. If we consider that normal neuron, that's a neuron that has its nerve endings in the elbow. Typically, if that was a neuron that was simulated, your brain in that primary somatosensory cortex would interpret that as pain in the elbow, okay? Now consider the remaining nerve that's left over after an amputation. It, that nerve used to go all the way down to the finger, but now it is also in the elbow. So if that nerve was to become stimulated, it is used to being interpreted in your brain as signaling pain in the finger. So even though that pain might be in the elbow, that stimulus is in the elbow, your brain is going to interpret it as being in the hand. After time, your brain essentially needs to remap that primary somatosensory cortex. So over time, your brain will learn that if that neuron is being stimulated, the signal is not coming from a finger. It is actually coming from the elbow as well. Referred pain is another example of kind of the brain being tricked a little bit. Uh, but this can actually be clinically helpful in several cases. So referred pain occurs when impulses from certain viscera, certain internal organs, um, such as the heart and appendix, are perceived as originating not from the organ itself, but from the skin in a different location. Um, so for example, pain in the appendix is often misinterpreted as coming from the umbilical region. 
And this happens because nervous impulses that are coming from cutaneous sensory receptors, such as these, and the ones that are coming from visceral sensory receptors, such as these, can enter the spinal cord through the same posterior roots, and they're often conducted even along the same ascending tracks up the spinal cord on the way to the brain. Now, while the exact mechanism isn't known at this point, um, the ultimate result is that the primary somatosensory cortex incorrectly identifies the pain. It's identifying the pain as coming from the skin as opposed to coming from that viscera. And it's not always the skin that is uh, just superficial to that organ. This is a map showing the common sites of referred pain. You've probably heard of, besides the, the appendicular one, the pain that's associated with a heart attack. You'll often hear that if people are having a heart attack, they'll feel the pain on the left side of their chest as opposed to the center of the chest right over where the heart is. And that pain will often radiate down the medial side of the left arm as well. Um, the liver and gallbladder is another good example. While this part of it might represent the approximate region and location of the liver and gallbladder, that pain can also be felt on the right shoulder as well. So those are several different examples of how that pain can be assessed um, in a location that it really doesn't ex exist or doesn't geographically represent the location of the, pain, of the viscera of, that is actually producing that pain. So the last thing I wanna talk about here under the general senses is uh, um, going into tactile receptors specifically in a little more detail. Tactile receptors are the most numerous type of receptor in your body, and they're located in the dermis and also the subcutaneous layer of the skin. And some of them actually can, can penetrate into the lower levels of the epidermis as well. Uh, with respect to their modality, these are uh, mechanoreceptors that react to touch, pressure, and vibration. And the exact structure of these receptors um, helps to determine how sensitive that sensation is uh, and um, how wide its range of reception is as well. So some of these receptors, such as those that are involved in fine touch, are extremely sensitive and they have very small receptive field, while crude touch and deep pressure provides much less information about the stimulus, but provides information over a wider, broader range. Uh, these tactile receptors fall into two broad categories based on whether their dendritic nerve endings are wrapped in connective tissue or glial cells or not. Um, if they are not wrapped in connective tissue or glial cells, then they are referred to as being unencapsulated. Uh, if the nerve endings of the dendritic nerve endings of these uh, neurons are indeed wrapped in connective tissue or glial cells, then they are referred to as being encapsulated. And I want to give you a quick overview of a few examples of each of these. So unencapsulated uh, free nerve endings are the simplest. They're found close to the skin surface, usually in the papillary layer of the dermis, which if you recall are all of these little ridges of the dermis that are popping up there. Um, but they can extend into some of the deep epidermal strata as well. Free nerve endings are typically detecting pain and temperature, just as if you recall the uh, nociceptors and the general, in general, nociceptors and thermoreceptors are uh, free nerve endings as well, um, but these uh, free nerve endings um, are can also be tactile receptors, and so some of these free nerve endings will detect very light touch and pressure. There are also uh, nerve and or unencapsulated nerve endings that are associated with the root hair plexus, or with or with the root of the hair, and those are referred to as the root hair plexus. They kind of form almost like a web-like structure around the root of the hair. So when the hair moves, it'll distort those dendrites and that'll initiate an action potential. So if you were to do something like take you know, uh, the top of your arm and kind of blow across it, you can feel the movement of the air because it is moving those hairs and therefore distorting those dendrites in the root hair plexus. And tactile discs are another really good example of unencapsulated nerve and um, unencapsulated tactile receptors. These are associated with special tactile cells that are depicted here in blue that are found in the stratum basale of the epidermis. These are extremely sensitive cells um, and they have a very, very small receptive field. And as you can see here, even a single neuron 
can have um, to these little tactile discs on individual dendrites that are present there as well. Uh, so what about unencapsulated ones? Uh, the lamellated corpuscles are very large encapsulated receptors, and they have, as you can see in this illustration here, a series of concentric rings, these concentric cellular layers that surround the dendritic endine, um, ending. And this basically shields it from uh, sources of stimulation other than just direct pressure. They're most sensitive actually to pulsation and vibration as opposed to pressure, in part because they are so deep as well. They're scattered throughout the dermis of the entire body, but they're most common in the dermis of the fingers, the breasts, and the external genitalia. They're also found in the walls of some viscera to detect deep pressure. The tactile corpuscles are the last type of uh, tactile receptor that I want to mention. And these are large oval-shaped corpuscles that are found in that papillary layer of the dermis again. And they're found in areas where the sense of touch is very well developed, so especially in structures such as the lips, the fingertips, the eyelids, the nipples, and the genitals. There's a fibrous capsule that surrounds that entire complex and it anchors it to that dermis of the skin, and it's able to detect very light touch. Uh, it's very sensitive to things such as shape and textures.